are Python people. Let's start there. Okay, we got some Python people. Most most Python. People. Okay, but you're like, yeah, yeah, maybe. And how people? How many people are R people? Okay. Okay, we got some. When you say R people. Yeah. What is it? What do I mean? I just spell it. I don't know. Whatever you. Uh, whatever you. Whatever you want it to mean. I don't know. It's, uh, yeah. Um, okay. Good. How many people are currently working as a data scientist? Okay. What's Data engineer? Okay, yeah, that's what my title was last class. Not quantifying, but... <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, so actually, yeah, I don't care if your title's data scientist. How many people are working at, like a data star position? Data analyst, data scientist, data engineer, any of these things? Okay, okay, cool. Cool, cool, cool. And then, and then so then we have some people who are maybe just like interested, kind of like, you know, they want to, you know, get a high level um, of what data science is about. Okay, that's helpful. I just like to know, kind of know the audience. Um, some of this is uh, maybe going to be confusing. This will be better if you guys are, if it's really interactive, you just jump in and ask a question. Okay, so that would be, that would be awesome. But let's, let's, let's jump in. You're probably wondering why this is, this is here. How many people have seen Inception? How many people have seen this? Some people have not seen this. This is a recorded talk. You should just go watch it. It's really good. It's like, uh, it's, a, it's a great movie. But um, when I think of metaprogramming, I think of Inception. Um, if you haven't seen the movie, this will not make as much sense, but in, in Inception, there's like, the premise is, uh, I'm not ruining much here, but the premise is that um, basically these people can create these dream worlds and then like kind of trick people into being inside of this dream world and then use that to extract information from them. Or that's typically how it's done. So in the movie, they wind up in a situation where they're like in a dream inside of a dream inside of a dream. It's like this like, you know, it's just dreams all the way down, right? And metaprogramming can feel like that sometimes. It's like. It gets a little weird. We're talking about programs that are about programs, about programs. And so, um, so yeah, Inception was kind of the first thing that I thought about. Um, and another thing that if you've seen the movie, a lot of people were like, ah, Inception's like kind of hard to understand. It's like not that accessible. Like what's really going on? Especially, especially the ending. Yeah, especially the ending. There's like, if you <laughs> Google Inception, there's like a ton of articles about Inception ending explained, right? right. Uh, so it's like, it's, it's not very accessible. Or trying so to explain. Yeah. It's, a, it's a nice, so I, again, Inception is a kind of a nice metaphor for metaprogramming. But my hope um, during the next uh, few minutes is to, um, to provide an introduction to make metaprogramming feel less like Inception, uh, to make it feel more approachable and less like, oh, what the heck's going on? We've got dreams instead of dreams, you know. So we're going to do an intro to metaprogramming in R. Um, Python will make some um, kind of special appearances. We'll make some disparaging remarks about it. And, um, <laughs> no, I mean, I'm half kidding. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we'll, we're mostly going to talk about R, and uh, you know, we'll talk about some Python stuff too. So, um, so, so yeah, let's get into it. Um, so this is just kind of an outline of the talk. Um, first, I want to motivate metaprogramming because uh, it's a little it's a little bit off the beaten path from like what we typically do when we're working with data. So why though? Why I care about metaprogramming? Uh, then we're going to talk um, about how it works in a few instances. And then I'm just going to talk a little bit about my journey, how I got kind of interested in metaprogramming in R and some of the problems that I was trying to solve. Um, so let's start with why. Uh, and I guess it's easier to explain why if we just have like a high level definition of metaprogramming. So this is, you know, this, you know, just in a few words, metaprogramming is about writing programs that understand or modify programs. Okay, this is this is a kind of a provisional definition. If that doesn't make sense, it'll make more sense because we're gonna flesh it out with some motivating examples. So first, this is the disparaging re remark here, and I'm like, I'm half trolling here, right? Don't, don't get too upset, but there are, there, there are like some nice things about PyR in terms of the API when you're working with wrangling data um, that I think are better than Pandas, and those things are actually powered by metaprogramming. So let's take a look at some of those. So this is, um, this is taken from the Pandas docs. Uh, so uh, Panda says like, th there's a page that's like uh, comparing, you know, uh, if you want to do something in DeepIR versus if you want to do it in Pandas. And so here we have like basically filtering uh, a data frame for you know column one or two equal to one. So this is how you do it in, uh, in Pandas. And by the way, if anybody's like, this is wrong, there's like a better way of doing it or whatever, please jump in and tell me because I'm not a Pandas guy, I'm a DeepIR guy. But this is from the docs, okay? So and they should fix their docs because this is. So, so this is how you filter a data type of pandas. Here's how you do it in R, deepy R. Okay. Now, the thing that I want to point out here is that there's no strings. There's no, there's, you're, not, 
they're using a string here to specify the column. So you say column equals one, and there's no and or anything, it's just comma, column equals zero. That's kind of nice. Maybe you're like, eh, whatever, not a big deal, like strings. All right, let's, let's talk about a few, few more examples. Maybe you're like, this is, you know, not a big deal. I don't mind writing a string or a quote. Um, so pandas work. So here's um, how you get rid of duplicates in pandas, uh, according to the docs. And here's how you do it um, with dplyr. Um, kind of nice, right? So you're, you don't have, you're not dealing with subsetting and strings and calling a method. You're just invoking this function. And then you're just saying column one. Nope, no need for a string. It's nice. Uh, let's do another example. Um, here's how you're um, you're basically adding a column here, um, and it's you're you know you're subtracting uh, B from A in this new column. You're calling it C. This is how you do this in uh, pandas. Here's how you do it in R. D by R. I think it's nice. This is a nice API. Again, no subsetting, no strings. Um, you're not prefixing your your A or B column references with this DF thing. It is nice and snappy. Okay. Um, and let's do, uh, I think, one more. Here's how you group by uh, a column and then aggregate compute a, a mean. Uh, this is a, a buggy example, it should say column two and then you're maybe you're calculating mean for column one. Uh, here's how you do it in R. Um, nice, I, I, I think it's nice, I think it's nice. Uh, you're not, there's no dictionaries, no strings or anything, you're just bada bing bada boom. Uh, kind of saying what you, what you want to do. Um, so these are these are some of the examples. I think the like not having to use strings in R is especially nice. Um, you don't have to worry about escaping strings if you're working with textual data. So getting rid of these quotes is nice and subsetting and all that. So hopefully you're like, oh, okay, you know, a lot of you guys are Python people, but hopefully you're like, oh yeah, this is kind of nice. Like I can see I can see some appeal here. And this this the, the kind of niceties of this API. This is powered by metaprogramming. This is what makes this possible. Uh, this kind of nice ergonomic way of, of running. Uh, let's focus on uh, something else here. Uh, so this is from this last example. Um, we see that we're, you know, we're, we're kind of doing some chaining, and chaining is, you know, pretty idiomatic in in, in Pandas. Uh, but there's uh, there's like a nice uh, kind of piece of uh, syntactic sugar here. It's called a pipe um, in R, and this is actually this is the base pipe. If you haven't seen that, the R the, the base R language now has its own pipe. You don't have to use the one from McGritter or whatever. <laughs> it's supposed to be, it's, it's, if you read the docs, it says it must be pronounced with a sophisticated French accent. That was my attempt, I apologize. You're here on a Saturday, what did you expect? So, uh, so we have this pipe thing, which is really nice. And um, so this is, the pipe stuff is a little controversial when people do chaining and piping. Apparently it's controversial within the Python community. This is a quote from Matt Harrison who wrote Effective Pandas. He says, I've had people say, this is the worst code that I've ever seen. And on the flip side, I've got people who said, this is awesome. It's changed how I write code. My life is much better. So let's do a quick survey. How many people like to do um, piping and chaining with their pandas code? And how many people are like, this is garbage. I hate it. Quick, quick, uh, quick survey. Oh, um, yeah, sorry. That was a confusing way of putting the question. <laughs> Raise your hand if you are anti-pipes and chains, uh, if, you, if you don't like them. Oh, okay, good. Everybody's already convinced. Oh, maybe you're, 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 you're kind of on the fence. Hey, kind of on the fence. All right, I'll go easy on this because most of you are convinced. Um, I'll, I'll just I'll just kind of fly through this. So here's like a nice. This is actually from Matt Harrison. Here's like a nice uh, motivating example for why pipes and chaining is nice. Um, all all he's trying to do is get to the bottom where A3 is like dropping kind of these columns, and he has to he creates all these intermediate variables along the way. And he's, his point is like, this is kind of messy. It's nicer if you just write something like this, where you just, you know, you dot pipe, dot assign, dot pipe, dot assign, dot drop. It kind of it reads like a recipe, and you can kind of just look at the steps of what you're trying to do while you're wrangling the data. I think this is a pretty convincing argument for like using pipes and, and chaining. Um, if you're not convinced, we can talk after. Most of you are already convinced. Let's move on. Um, but okay, the thing that I want to focus on, this is all a bit of a tangent, is in Python, the way that we do piping, how many people know about pipe for data frames pandas? Do people know about this? Okay, great. So in some instances, you can't just like chain off of the data frame. And so you're using this pipe uh, method uh, to kind of, you know, you kind of want to keep chaining, but it's like, it's a way of kind of cheating with the chaining stuff. So you have this pipe method so that you can not break a chain. It's pretty nice, but 
The pipe operator in R, I think, is nicer than this dot pipe method. And again, the pipe operator is powered by metaprogramming. Okay, so this is this kind of the second example to motivate why metaprogramming is cool, why it's worth learning about. Uh, again, it's kind of in the service of this, like making really nice APIs for human robots. Um, uh, quick, quick note: the pipe operator in R is like so popular that it's like it's when you use R Studio, there's a hotkey for using the pipe. Right. Like it's just like boom, you press that and you get a pipe, and it's it's nice. Um, it's just R people like pipes. Some Python people, not so much. I guess I, we, we don't have that in this room, which is good. I'm glad I'm with good people, except for you. Watching. <laughs> I'm watching. I'm watching. So I ran into Wes McKinney at a conference a couple months ago. This is the guy who made pandas, kind of. He doesn't say that. He gets mad if you say he made those pandas. But, um, but he did say, like, oh, yeah, I wish we could do pipes in Python, but we don't have non-standard evaluation. This is a metaprogramming thing, OK? Um, so this is, metaprogramming is cool. Um, OK, so that's pipes. Um, let's talk about. Let's talk about another neat thing you can do with metaprogramming. Um, and I, I'm curious if this is if this kind of exists in Python. I was I was looking for this, but I couldn't really see um, something that was equivalent. So let's let's look at this again. So right now I'm working with a data frame and memory. Um, now I'm working at a, a, I'm using a Postgres connection, and I'm treating it as though it's a data frame. Okay, it's not. I'm not working with data in memory, but I'm, I'm treating it as though it's in memory. Okay. And I can use the same dplyr API to interface with this data frame as if it was a memory, but it's not. Okay, so I'm using the same API as if it was memory, but it's not. It's actually a Postgres connection. It's nice, and I know that there are some things like this in Python. Um, and basically what happens is behind the scenes, SQL gets generated, and then you can execute it against the database. Pretty cool, also powered by metaprogramming. Um, and some of you who know about metaprogramming might be like, do you really need metaprogramming for that? Like, it's kind of like, seems like people got a little too excited about metaprogramming. They're just like, let's use it here. Here's an instance where um, metaprogramming is actually useful for, for an API like this. So suppose I want to create a new column, and uh, they, you know, the, the way this new line reads here is uh, column one, if uh, x is greater than 100, uh, make it 100, you're, you're kind of like, uh, you're kind of clipping it at 100, right? And then else, keep it, keep it the same. So you're writing this, this is just, you know, this if statement is just a standard R if statement, right? And what happens is that this actually gets translated into a case when in SQL using metaprogramming. It's parsing this, this if statement, this R if statement, and converting it into <coughs> SQL, which is really nice, and that's using, that's using metaprogramming. So just another instance where um, metaprogramming helps us create really nice APIs. Is, is, that, is that still declared, this Postgres connection, or is that another library? Uh, it is still deep. Uh, it's DB ply R is what it's called. Yeah, yeah. DB ply R. Yeah. The data, the, the, the DB for the database. Yeah. So are you always guaranteed one-to-one -one API parity between DB player and the player? Um, I mean, pretty much. There's um, there's an asterisk there. I think it, you can repeat the question. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. I should. Yeah, because of the recording. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so the, the question was whether there's like. Whether we're guaranteed API parity between dplyr and dbplyr, and I said pretty much. Um, there's a few things that, uh, if you try and do them, they're they're not they're not supported. They don't have like a database equivalent, and so you'll get a nice error message. Um, you know that that's like, hey, you know, you gotta do you gotta do this other thing. Um, but for the most part, it's you know it works as you would expect, and it's really nice that you can write our code. And get SQL like you're it's not you're not putting it in a string you're not like having to learn like any new way of, of working um, and it gets translated into, into SQL which is pretty cool powered by metaprogramming okay so hopefully um, oh one more thing that's powered by metaprogramming that's really nice when you're working with these database connections is suppose you want to invoke a user defined function at, you know on your Postgres database Snowflake whatever um, what you do is you just you call this function as if it's defined in the R environment. And it's not, okay, Postgres UDF is not defined in the R environment, but when this actually evaluates, it translates it into a SQL string that invokes the UDF uh, in, in, in Postgres SQL. So you basically get to pretend that you have this function defined in R, but it's not. It's kind of cool. Um, I don't, but like, how, how, how do you test your code? How do they, you're like, <laughs> oh, it's not sure, it's not sure. Maybe it's, maybe it's sketchy, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can talk about that, we can talk about that. Um, 
Well, okay, what, so the question is how do you test your code? What, what, do you, what exa say more, like what exactly? Like, if you don't have this function existing locally, how can a unit test this block of Oh, code? sure. Yeah, it's a good question. What you would have to do, you would probably have to do the unit testing on like a local test database or something like that, right? That's, I think that's how you would have to do it. Um, that's a, it's a good question, yeah. Um, still, I think it's nice to have the option to do this kind of thing, right? Um, okay, so all powered by metaprogramming. Oh, sorry, I should have this over here. This makes it a little clearer what's going on here. Like, you're, th this is kind of the SQL that's generated from that uh, DB client R uh, pipeline. Okay, so so hopefully at this point you're like you're not the why though guy. You're like you're like ah oh, metaprogram is pretty cool, and maybe you're like this now, and you're like oh apply metaprogramming everywhere, and like that's not so great. But I, I'm excited that you're like closer in that direction. Like if you're, you're like hopefully you are at least motivated to hear me out for the rest of the talk learn more about metaprogramming. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about, uh, let's do a few um, examples of how some of these things work. And we're not gonna go through everything that I just covered because, yeah, we've already been talking for like 15, 20 minutes. But let's, let's, look at, let's look at how some of this works. So this is the first example of like the pandas versus dplyr kind of uh, API comparison that I made. Let's talk about how, uh, the, you know, the, the, the thing on the left works. Uh, so let's, let's look at a simpler example. Um, in R, so let's say we have this data frame. We have you know your X column, your Y column, your Z column, and um, you know kind of the like not so fancy way of adding these things up is what you see in the second line here, right? This is like you're not doing any meta programming here. This is just you know whatever the standard R stuff. Um, but a lot of you probably know about this with function in base R, and what you do with with is you pass in the data frame as a first parameter. And then after that, you can add X, Y, and Z, these, these uh, kind of pieces of the data frame. Uh, you can just add them up without prefixing them with a DF dollar sign, which is for your Python people, it's kind of like the DF sub, um, you know, square bracket and then quote, and that's kind of, it's the R quote over there. So we get to skip all of this. This goes away, and we just say it once, and then boom, 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 it's nice. Okay, this is, I think it's nice. How does it work? With, How, or quick guess. How many lines of code do you think it takes to implement with within R? Right, it gives us this nice kind of uh, syntax sugar, this nice way of working with data. How many lines do you think it is in R? Anyone, anyone want to venture a guess? I mean, the stakes are low. I'm just going to kick you out if you're wrong. You're wrong! Get out of here. <laughs> I'm kidding. Anybody else want to guess? Five. Five? Five? Less than that. Uh, two guesses is enough. I don't want to anymore. It's two. There's two lines. Yeah. This function. We're gonna we're gonna break down each of these lines. What does this mean? Stop by the first line. We're using this is a weird word, enclosure, in this function. Enclo, enclo. I don't I don't know. Whatever. What does this What does this mean? This is from Hadley Wickham. He's like the Jesus of R for Python people. Like he's you know this is this is the guy. Um, so he's explaining what where this name comes from. I don't know how to pronounce this word. I didn't even know what this word was until last night. Um, but it's, it apparently has something to do with a briefcase that has two parts. But it, there's like a English language, uh, it's like a metaphor for smashing two words together in the English language. I'm not even gonna try to pronounce it. The name is a, a quoting and closure. Because a closure both quotes the expression and encloses the environment. So let's talk about quoting and expression first. This is like kind of maybe a new thing. Um, Let's just talk about English. Forget about programming. Um, we can say to, to someone, we can say, add one to X, right? And if they're a nice person, they'll do it for us. Or we can say, she said, add one to X. And that's, there's, a, there's a, I'm, you're not making a command there. You're quoting someone else making a command, right? There's something analogous that we can do with our code using metaprogram. So <clears throat> let's, let's look at this example here. Let's say X is 42. X, if we say x plus one in the REPL, we get 43. And this is analogous to the add one to x, right? It's the REPL is doing what we tell it to do. But if we call this quote function, the REPL just gives us x plus one. And this is analogous to the she said add one to x. Right? The, we're not telling R to do the thing yet. We're capturing, we're quoting the command. We're gonna do something with it later. Okay, but R has this, this notion of quoting. Uh, which is which is kind of interesting, and this is this is what powers the um, the, the, the 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 nice the nice API features that we can see. We'll see a little more in a second. Any questions here? 
How are we doing so far? This is like, uh, go ahead. I have both. I've, ne I've never programmed in R. So is there a Python or C++ or anything sort of close to like where it's been set? I don't think there is. Um, there's, so. Have you seen expert, like EXPR in Python? Oh no, I haven't. Tell, tell me about this. It, it, it will run as express. I don't know if that quote is a string or if it's that's not a string, and that's oh, yeah. the that's the thing yeah. that's like yeah. yeah. So you can pass a string to expert, yes. and it will evaluate the string. I've seen I've yeah. seen that. Yeah. Considered bad practice, though. Is this considered bad practice in R? This is okay. Um, like the, R is like so a lot of people metaprogramming gets a bad rap, right? Because people get excited about it, and then they use it in situations where it doesn't belong, and then things blow up. I, and, and so like, in, you know, I started in Java. That was my first programming language. So like you learn about reflection and they're like, don't ever use it. If you're using reflection, you're using metaprogramming, you know, you're, you're effing up. Um, and R is not as much like that. Like they're a little more liberal with the use of it. So I don't think it's, I mean, they probably do say things like, yeah, you probably don't need it, but they're like, they use it like, you know, for, to power things like use by R. So you see it a lot. Um, I think I answered your question. Yeah. So, so you're right, yeah, there, there is a way of like evaluating strings within Python. But the thing that I think is novel to R is it's like, this is not a string. You're just typing in like the text and it, there's no quotes here. It's just, it, there's no quotes here. It's just, it's, um, it's not evaluating this even though it's not a string. So another, put differently, the way that you quote in other languages is you put quotation marks around it, make it a string. In R, you can do this quotation maneuver without adding quotes, which is kind of interesting. You call this quote function instead. Uh, how are we doing? Are we are we still are we with me? We we're good. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry, I'm, I'm so confused. Is this like a lambda then? Uh, no, not necessarily. It could be. Um, it's not a function. Um, you know, you see that it's just x plus one. So like, it's you. I could put quote one in there. It uh -huh. could just be. It could just be a constant. Okay. And it would still work. I think, uh, yeah. I think you'll see it more clearly when you do a function and you try to assign a variable that is going to be then processed in the diff line. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, okay. I, th I think that's right. Yeah, I think it will get clearer as we move yeah. on. Yeah. Okay, okay. Because so this, this is because how you grab using R syntax and you basically postpone executing so you can generate a program. Boom! Program generation scheme. The well said. You're postponing the, the execution. That's the name for it, target generation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're postponing the execution of this thing. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying add one to X. I'm saying, you know, she said or he said, add one to X. Don't do it now, okay? We're gonna save, save this thing. We're gonna save this thing right here. We're gonna evaluate it later. Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so this would be like, like lazy execution. There is, yes, lazy execution is a good way of talking about it. Absolutely. Okay, yep, okay, yep, right. yep, yep, okay, yep, 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 yep. Okay, good, good, good. Thank you so much for your help. I wasn't sure how the English language, like, kind of metaphor would work for this, and it sounds like not so good. We needed some help. Thank you. Um, so lazy execution is a way we were talking about it. Um, and you, you, I think you also said, like, delaying execution. Program so generation. Program generation, yeah. yeah. We'll the whole thing. These, are, these are helpful. Okay, so let's move on from here. So hopefully we kind of, we understand this, like, quoting and expression idea. Let's talk about enclosing an environment. And unfortunately, we're gonna take another tour through the, um, the English language metaphor and we can, we can fix it up. So, um, so we have this expression that's been quoted. It, you know, so it says, she said add one to X. Now you can imagine some time passes and now we wanna do, do what she said. She said this, do, do what she said, add one to X. And you can, you can imagine like, oh crap, I forgot what X is, <laughs> right? I don't know, I, so I can't, I can't do this. I don't know what X is, right? Environments solve this problem, environments map variables to values. So we saw in the example, x is 42. Um, so if we have an environment that's bound to x, uh, now we can say, oh yeah, it's 43, because x is 42, right? So the, the, the enclosure is, is combining these two concepts of quoting and environments. Uh, so that's what's going on in this first, this first line of code. So when you call the link function, you're passing in an expression, and when you call and quote on it, you're in quote, uh, you're, you're quoting that expression, you're not gonna evaluate it, and you're also taking in the environment in which that expression was originally kind of stated. Uh, so those two things happen in that first line. Let's talk about the second line. How are we, how are we doing? Are we good here? Can we move on to the second line? 
We good? Okay. Second line, eval tidy, which is, this is like, you know, we've seen stuff like this in Python and other languages, right? So this is like, typically in other languages, you like, you give this thing a string and then some environment to like execute the string, uh, some environment to like execute the code in and then it just does it. That's, that's kind of what we see here. Um, we're passing it this enclosure that we made, and then we're also passing it the data frame. And um, why, why did we pass it the data frame? So what, we could not pass it the data frame, and basically what this would do is we would say, okay, now do what she said, and I have the amount, so I, I can, you know, I can actually compute on X. Uh, but we are gonna pass in this, this data frame. And what this is saying in English is, now do what she said, and add the vectors from this data frame to the environment, or add the columns from the data frame to the environment. So that's what makes it possible when we call with data frames, vectors, X, Y, and Z have been added to the environment. So now X, Y, and Z are bound without the DF prefix in the environment. And we quoted this thing. If we call this thing without quoting, we get an error because these things are not defined in the global environment. So we quoted it first. We said, hey, don't, don't execute this now. Execute it later. I'm going to give you an environment for executing it. The environment that I give you is this from this data frame, and it's going to grab these columns off of it. Right? So this is how with works, roughly, um, within R, and it's, it makes it so that you get these kind of nice, you know, syntactic sugar. There's a nice way of working with the language. Does this make sense? Pretty cool, right? I think it's dope. Um, all right. So what is, oh, I, I should have done the slide earlier. Uh, but this is just a recap. Uh, so English language equivalent. So she said X plus Y plus Z. It's quoted. Okay, now do what she said and add the vectors from the data frame to the environment or add the columns from the data frame to the environment. So this is the English equivalent of calling this with function. So that's that. Uh, hopefully we kind of understand how this works now. Let's talk about how how this SQL generation stuff works. Right, we, the, the, this line right here. Right, the, the mutate line where we're just writing our init else R code, and we're getting some nice SQL. Um, let's let's see if we can do some, some coding. It's easier to just show this. Okay. Uh, okay, I need to. How am I doing on time? Am I running over? Am I okay? We have until four thirty, but no one's going to keep us out. How are we? Can we see this? Yeah. Great. So, um, I remember what I wanted to do here. Let's do this. And let's do this. Okay. So, what I wanted to show here was this, like, this if else stuff, right? So, um, I'm going to use a function from this package called Lobster. Um, <laughs> that helps illustrate some of this metaprogramming stuff that I want to show you. So if I, um, if I call this function AST from Lobster, and I pass in if true uh, one else two, I get a nice representation of the abstract syntax tree of the code that I just typed in. Again, there's no, there's no strings here, right? Because we, we quoted this thing. So we quoted the thing, and then we get the abstract syntax it's nice. And when you use um, uh, expression, uh, this express function, which is similar to the enclosure function, um, you uh, you can see that the REPL is just returning this kind of without quotes. Um, this is like a way of kind of saying that it's been quoted, <coughs> um, which is confusing. It's without quotes, but it's a way of saying that it's been quoted. Um, once you have this thing, you can subset into it um, and, and an abstract syntax tree, we, we probably know this is a this is a tree structure. And so we can we can basically examine the tree structure of the code and use that to generate other code. Um, and then this is like how the SQL generation works. So you can see here, I've quoted this if true one else two. Um, that returns a tree uh, tree-like structure. The first um, element in this thing is the if um, function, because uh, everything's kind of a function. Um, if I want to look at the second thing, 
It's going to be the test that I put into the PDF statement. And the third thing is the, you know, the thing to return if it's true, and then the thing to return if it's false. And so you can, you can examine the tree of like much more complicated expressions, and once you kind of parse that tree, you can, you can generate code and do whatever you want, right? So this is, uh, this is kind of a neat, um, a neat thing that powers uh, the, the nice SQL generation stuff that we saw. Um, so I'm going to stop here for now. Does this make sense to people? Make sense? So that's a little hand wavy. Um, I'm, glad, I'm glad it makes sense, but but um, I, I think it's I think it's a little hand wavy. And so uh, if you want to learn more about that, I would recommend um, there's this advanced R book, and um, chapter 18 in particular goes through how you can parse these abstract syntax trees using recursion. You can handle kind of more complicated expressions. Um, there's some nice like some nice data that, that I've actually used. Okay. So we've, uh, we've hopefully I've like convinced you that metaprogramming is worth paying attention to. We've talked a little bit about how it's possible, um, how some of these, these things work. And now I just want to talk a little bit about um, how I started getting interested in metaprogramming in R um, and, and like some of the kind of uh, problems that I tried to solve with it. Um, hopefully that sounds interesting. I didn't I didn't say this in like the talk description. Um, so Kevin, if it's not allowed, you can just. Get out the what? What do they call that thing? It's like a hook that you pull the pull the guy off the stage. What's it? What's it called? We use the vaudeville, I suppose. Oh yeah, vaudeville. Yeah, the vaudeville. I don't know what it's yeah, called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll call it the vaudeville. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, feel free to get the hook out. It's um, starting to get really boring because uh, this is you know autobiographical for a while. So my my journey is a little bit like Frodo's. I like people have seen Lord of the Rings, right? I'm getting old, so I know people who haven't seen Lord of the Rings. Like, what are you doing? People, have everybody seen it? People are scared to admit that they haven't seen it because they know I'm going to tell them to leave. <laughs> so Frodo thinks that he just has to take the ring to Rivendell. It's not that far. Like, I'll get there and it'll just be done. We'll wrap this whole saga up in like an hour, you know? But no, it's a nine hour saga. You gotta go all the way to Mordor. And that's kind of like my relationship with metaprogramming. I just had like this small thing that was bothering me. Here's a small thing. <clears throat> you were talking about how. Uh, in real life, you work with data that doesn't fit in, on your laptop. That's right. And um, I was doing some data visualization at Heath, where we had a bunch of data stored in Snowflake. And um, at some point, you want to pull a subset of that data locally to do some visualization or do some stuff that's like harder to do in Snowflake. And I kept running into the situation where I pull, try and pull down too much data and just completely f up my R session, so I get the right. bomb. And it drove me nuts because it's like. I don't know, it was like kind of hard for me to remember to do, to do that, and like it was a little bit of a pain, right? Like, why is it a pain? I'm, I'm like kind of a complaining kind of guy. Why is it a pain, Matt? It's not that big of a deal. So this is, uh, this is the, the offending code, here, right? You have the Snowflake data frame, right? We're, we're leveraging the dbplyr stuff that we talked about earlier, where we can just treat it like it's in memory even though it isn't. And I'm gonna call this collect thing at the bottom, and that's gonna, that's gonna blow it up. Instead of calling collect immediately, I should count it first and just look at how big how much, how much data? Not a big deal, right? But it is for me, because I'm actually a programmer. That's I spent most of my life doing, pro, like my career doing programming stuff. And I'm like, I, I have to like move my cursor down. You know, I use Vim, right? So J, 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 a couple of takes. <laughs> okay, write, this, write this out, count thing, look at the result, come back up here, then execute this, right, in my data notebook. Some people are like, it's not a big deal. It was annoying to me. <clears throat> So, um, oh yeah, what weird slide. So what I did is I, I said, no, 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 I want a hotkey that I can press. That when I um, have my, when I select this part of the, of the expression, just these first two lines, not the collect part, it'll execute this line of code in my R console and I'll get a count. I don't have to move the cursor anywhere. I just invoke the hotkey, boom, and, I, and then I get my count and then I can, I can call collect and know I'm not gonna abort my R session. Right, this is what I wanted. Um, so this is, you know, it's a little bit of metaprogramming, right? We're, we're, we're like, we're, we're writing some code that is concerned with the code that I'm writing. Um, and so I used a package called Shortcuts. This is a cool R package. It basically makes it possible to make any, bind any R function to an RStudio shortcut. So I just wrote a little function, did a little bit of metaprogramming, 
Um, and and then when I invoke uh, you know command shift C, I get this count call, and I can be on the way. Nice. Um, so that's I can kind of dip my toe in the water of metaprogramming to do that. Then I. Um, I came up with what I thought was this like bombshell insight. We were analyzing some data uh, about how people used Heap. Heap is a product analytic company, in case you don't know. They're tracking how people are using digital products and uh, making it easy, excuse me, for product managers, et cetera, to kind of understand how people are using that product, understand what features to build, what features to kill, blah, blah, blah. So I thought I had this bombshell insight about how people were using Heap. Details don't matter. I present it to uh, the product team. My boss says, um, hey, you didn't use the sessions column for this, did you? Like, you need to use the sessions under bar real column. Not the session, the sessions under bar real column. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, crap. Um, and so, you know, a few, a few hours later, thankfully, the bombshell insight stands up. It's still true when I use the correct call. But we're all scared for a few hours, right? Because we, we use the wrong column. And so there's like this, yeah, it's like, this is kind of, this is a scary thing, and it was a little weird. And it got me thinking about what it's like to wrangle data, clean data, work with data. And it's kind of like, hopefully this is the next, the right slide. Oh, okay, let me go through a few other examples of like, things that can go wrong as, as you're working with data. You can sometimes have bad joins. You think you have these like unique relationships and you're joining together, and it's like, it's, you know, there's something weird that happens there. And, uh, so your data isn't shaped the way you think it is. Uh, sometimes you're, uh, Sometimes you accidentally compare small groups. So that's like a trivial example of this is like, um, oh wow, people in the experimental group converted 100%. How many people in the experimental group? One. Yeah. But you don't, if you don't check that, you're, you're kind of screwed, right? And so you're presenting this, this false information. Another example, you might have bugs in like some mutation code, some code where you're adding a new column, you're doing some sort of computation. Um, you're, maybe you're, you know, you're writing a regex to fix the string stuff. Um, or maybe there's just data quality issues. Maybe there's like a typo in the data somewhere, and it's like it's a little tricky to to kind of to kind of find these things sometimes. And so um, I, I started to feel like working with data is kind of like old like old chainsaws. So like this is apparently this chainsaw is from the '50s, okay? And it's like super easy to cut your finger off, right? There's like there's nothing to help you from cutting your finger off. Right, yeah, it's just not, <laughs> compare that to like a more modern chainsaw where it's like, you, go. you gotta like really try to cut your finger. I mean, well, I don't want to say anything about this. Maybe some people have, I, but like, you know, you've gotta like, you gotta pull the trigger, you gotta push this thing up, your, your hand's here, your hands are nowhere near the chainsaw, so it's like kind of hard to make a mistake. And so I was like, yeah, like it seems like we can use metaprogramming to, to make working with data more like the modern chainsaw instead of the old chainsaw. So, um, so what I, what I did, this is a kind of a stupid example, but uh, what I did is I, I wrote um, this R Studio plugin. It watches the R code that you write, and and it generates data visualizations for you based on that R code. And it's using metaprogramming, right? You're, this is it's a very simple expression, just one data frame. You can imagine something more complicated. And so what this is showing you is the percentage of missing values in every column in the data frame. So you're not like did I use sessions or sessions real? Like you can kind of see immediately which one you should be using. Uh, and um, and then here, you know, this you can see data quality issues. This is the Palmer Pen Palmer Penguins is another one of those data sets that people I don't know, it's big in the R community. I don't know if Python people know about this. But Palmer Penguins is a, is a nice one. But here you see that there are these these typos related to the species of penguin. You get these things kind of popping up automatically for you by parsing the R code as you're writing. And so data analysis starts to feel more like uh, the modern changes instead of the, you know, the, the, the scary one. And you can also move a little faster, right? So this is, this is something that I started getting interested in. Um, like how can we use metaprogramming to make data analysis faster and safer? We've already, we've seen some examples of how it's faster, right? like kind of the nicer APIs and ergonomics. Um, but yeah, how do we make it faster and safer? Maybe automate, automatically generating visualizations is interesting. Um, that can help you move faster, can help you move in a safer way. Um, and so yeah, and this is like, uh, I know this is a little kitschy, okay, but now you're gonna see an ad. So I started a company <laughs> to do this kind of stuff. And I'll be really brief about it, but this is like, this is what I'm, this is what I'm interested in, this is what I'm working on right now. And um, yeah, just trying to do a lot of metaprogramming. I would love to talk to you about metaprogramming stuff, but this is, um, this is what I'm up to. 
Um, and that's, that's the end of the talk. Uh, so hopefully metaprogramming feels less like Inception now, a little more, a little more approachable. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. Does anybody have any questions? Or?